plat picard. Allons-y. Ta gueule. Je parle un petit français. C'est vrai, c'est vrai. Hey there, welcome back once again. It is time for the golden age of DC Comics. 365 days where I take this well-loved hardcover coffee table book given to me about two decades ago by one of my best friends. This book has been surfing my coffee table ever since and has been a constant source of comic book shop style conversations. The kind I wish to recreate today here with you. That's right, you. Thank you so very much for tuning in. You are the most important part of our show. The most important ingredient in our recipe here. This conversation that we've been having all year long. You know what we're going to do? Because we're going to use this book for its intended purpose. We're going to open it up to today's date, which is December the 17th. We are going to look at some comic book art of an antediluvian age. We're going to read the blurb, and then we're going to talk about comic books because we are going to talk about comic books every day for the rest of the year. That's right. I'm exuberant. I'm sharing my ebullience with the internet and the world. This is a 2004 Abrams publication written and curated by Les Daniels, Chip Kidd, and Jeff Spear. I like to pimp this book because I left the, the, um, the link to its Amazon page in the description where you can get your own copy. It will look great on your coffee table. You can play along at home. And it makes a great gift for a geek. I know. All righty. Well, let's get to it. I hope you're having a great day. I hope you're clobbering your problems and not being clobbered by them. I fell down a rabbit hole thanks to Pika, leaving me some great uh, open windows to fall out of. Remember, is it John Irving that said, always walk past open windows in the Hotel New Hampshire? It's sound advice. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but not when uh, your executive producer has left you great show notes. Pika makes show notes. See, he's got a pen and everything. He's, what do you think he does all day? Sits around like a stuffed animal? Well, <laughs> let's get to it. Um, the golden age of DC Comics runs between 1938 and 1955 because we're going a little bit before that today um, in our conversation. And um, which could be called the Platinum Age. But the Golden Age runs between 1938 and 1955. The Silver Age between 1956 and 1970. The Bronze Age, I'm a Bronze Age baby myself, between 1970 and 1985. And the Copper Age begins in 1985. I get these definitions and terms from the most... The most... I get these definition and terms from the most current edition of the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide. This is the 52nd edition uh, made for 2002-2003. I'm also getting how to grade comics, the Overstreet publication. And it's going to be, these are going to be important parts of uh, the show going forward next year when we've run out of days in this 365 days book. We are moving on to floppies. We're going to be talking and celebrating about our love of comic books and the floppy itself. Now, trade paperbacks are cool and all, but I, I love the publication. I love the magazine. I love everything about a, a, a comic book. And the older, the better sometimes, in my humble opinion. So, uh, yeah, I get these definitions in terms of the ages from the glossary. You guessed it, of the most current edition of the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide. There's a link in the description to the last year's page. I have to update that. I will be doing that shortly. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Let's get to it. We're going to open up to today's date, December the 17th. And um, yeah, it's a slow news day. Spinner rack. Talk about the uh, the next show, we're go which we're going to do. But we got the uh, the whip-wielding uh, Mr. America and his um, sidekick, Fat Man. Yeah, it's a slow news day. So we're going to be talking about something else shortly. Yeah. Uh, art by Bernard Bailey from Action Comics, issue number 51, August of 1942. And remember, America had just entered World War II. But in the Pacific Theater, America won't kind of ent officially enter uh, the European Theater until D-Day in 1944. Uh, World War II has been going on since 1939. And um, 
Westerner Tex Thompson, who reinvented himself as the costume hero, Mr. America, later teamed up with Fat Man for a series of adventures. For a brief period, they were known as the Americamandos. Dun, dun, dun. Then Tex took the more fashionable America Mando moniker for him for his own, and poor old Fat Man was reduced again to being merely fat. He eventually drifted away and left Tex to his own devices. I believe he actually ended up on Batman in the fifties as a uh, kind of uh, full of a body positive um, comic relief and foil. And some of those wackier Batman editions. So yeah, that's the uh, you know. Let's be consistent. Let's look at the art. All right, it's one panel. It's a it's a zoom up of one panel. And we've got uh, some dialogue from the police officer here. Great work, boys. Drag that wreck off to jail and tell the newspapers it used to be called the Framer. Dun dun dun. And look. He's in a business suit. He's sharp looking there. You know what I mean? There's something about, you know, gangsters in suits, right? Any resemblance to a human being is purely coincidental. I embellished that. I threw in an accent, too. Why not? I, I mean, I do voices. <laughs> it's a tough time to do voices. It really is. Oh, my gosh. Ask a voice actor. <laughs> but that's all we're going to have. You know, yeah, I mean. Like I said, slow news day. I was in a conversation on another channel with a good group of comic book minded friends and individuals that congregate and talk comics. I'm blessed. So are you. So are we. We often see each other in the live chats in other shows. And it's always good to see you all out there. And um, my buddy James Harris brought up um, uh, the BDs of Europe um, because, you know, the, the BDs are uh, bandes and es. Uh, of Europe, and these are the European comic books going on um, you know, across the pond. See, James is in uh, Japan and has gone all over Europe too in his travels, but he's lived in Japan for 20 years. He's an American and uh, he lives there in uh, in Japan. And um, he was talking about the, the, the band SNS and being trans, and there was like a being translated into Japanese and sold on the Japanese market. So it's kind of like the reversing engine, reverse engineering what we consider manga. You know, I've, I've got plenty of manga around here somewhere. It's just not in arm's reach. I just got the newest edition of Dragon Ball Super number 17. I've been reading Dragon Ball for, for, for 25 years or more. It's, it's wonderful. It's actually been a long, strange trip. <laughs> but these like print, these print publications, these sequential art, you know, stories from more than just our culture. Now, America may have, inter you know, um, innovated the classic superhero as we know it today, starting with Superman in 1938, beginning of the, uh, the Golden Age with Action Comics number one. You know, Superman, the trunks, the cape, the powers, you know, the unbelievableness of it all. And then comes Batman and... Then comes Captain America over at Timely Comics. There was Namor already and the Human Torch. You know, so there was just... Um, oh, as I forgot to say, you know, what goes great with a, a coffee table book and a coffee table talk? Well, I need more coffee, but pull up a chair to this coffee table. We're going to start talking about comics, and specifically European comics, the BDs. Um, Band des années. And yeah, I, I, I took French in high school. I retained a lot of it. I love working with um, my Asian co-workers because they speak Creole and I can speak French to them. And it's a good excuse to speak French to, you know, to keep in practice. I, I speak bad French, but I got a good accent. I know that much. I One time it was in uh, Montreal, I uh, know, no, in Quebec City, uh, old Quebec City and uh, the Frontenac Hotel. You know, there's the rivers right there and there's a, a little esplanade and on Saturday mornings, I guess they have something called the Bucanist, which is like secondhand books being sold at market, like in an outdoor fair. And I picked up probably about 12 Dragon Balls and French edition, too, which were great because um, it was interesting because they were they were read traditional Western style from, you know, from left to right. So all the pages were like just flips So Goku's insignia is always on the wrong side, you know, and it's flipped. 
but it didn't edit out cigarettes, violence, bloodshed, or nudity. And it kept the original. So there is something always lost in translation, in the adaptation, and trying to clean it up for someone else's culture. Things that are appropriate in Japanese may not be appropriate in, in America. Therefore, things are tinkered with along the way. But Band Dozen A's, I mean, so yeah, James brought up the Band Dozen A's because we were just talking about comic books. And I'm, I'm, I feel that I'd be remiss if I never brought up Band Dozen A's in this great grand comic book conversation that we're having here today with each other. <laughs> what are some of your Band Dozen A's? You know, I want to talk about Tintin. And also, I liked Asterix as well. But I feel that, uh, and also something like uh, like Blueberry by, uh, by by Mobius, you know, Jean Giraud. I mean, gosh, that's such a, wow. I mean, I love, I love European comics. I mean, they, they always were a little bigger, bolder. I mean, this is Meta Barons by uh, uh, Jodorowsky and Jimenez. This is amazing, mature, violent, graphic, um, kind of. You know, there are levels to unpack. There's a savagery that you'd only see in something like Heavy Metal Magazine or old Conan magazines. Um, but Band A's and A's. I want to talk about Tintin for a minute. And while I was looking at this, is, I fell down some rabbit holes that Pika left open. Walk past open windows. But I got open windows right here. And I was... Um, I'm going to talk about Tintin for a minute. Uh, Tintin started in 1929 so it predates the golden age of comic books by uh, by decade and it was a it was a newspaper strip like remember newspaper strips are where it was at comic books were were a new thing that was an experiment it was like they just comic books took it on on its own thing but newspaper strips were everybody read the newspaper strips everybody read newspapers so in Europe, you know, we all know who Tintin is. Tintin, the Adventurer by Hergé. Um, and it, it, Tintin has a series of 24 band designate albums created by Belgian cartoonist Georges Rémy, who wrote under the pen name Hergé. The series was one of the most popular European comics of the 20th century. Um, by 2007, a century after Hergé's birth in, 2000, in 1907, Tintin had been published in more than 70 languages with sales of more than 2 million copies has been adapted for radio, television, theater, and film. And you know where I'm reading from. I'm reading from the wiki. ATSD, ATSD, the wiki. <laughs> okay, that's my Rich Evans uh, tribute. I love Red Letter Media. I love you, Rich Evans. I love you, Jay, Mike. Everyone else too, you know, the other guys. <laughs> oh God, I can't, I can't remember anyone's name right now. Um, but it was first published in uh, January tenth of nineteen twenty nine in Le, Pe Le Petit Vingtième, the little twelfth, the, tw the little twentieth, a youth supplement to the Belgian newspaper Le Vingtième Siècle, uh, the twentieth century. This is a you know a Belgian newspaper, yeah. Uh, the, ser the success of the series led to serialized strips published in Belgium's leading newspaper, Le Soir, The Evening, and spun into a successful Tintin magazine. In 1950, Hergé created Studio Hergé, which produced the canonical versions of 11 Tintin albums. The series is set during a largely realistic 20th century. Its hero is Tintin, a courageous young Belgian reporter and adventurer, aided by his faithful dog Snowy, Milou, in the, in the original uh, French edition. And he's got this whole cast of characters, and it's uh, it's just adventure. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's early 20th century European adventures. You know, trains, overcoats, espionage. This and that, the other thing, you know, you know, cliffhangers, and uh, humor, and, and and pathos, and and tension. Just I, I need to catch up on Tintin. I need to go get some Tintin in French, and I need to challenge myself to read. I can read French, assisted. I need a dictionary, but I, you know, it's a good excuse to get a French to English dictionary. I don't, I don't, I might have one somewhere. 
But like, you know, you ever read L'Etranger by Albert Camus? I mean, in its original French, I mean, it's more moving. It just, there's something lost in translation uh, to the, to, I just, like, if, if there's a suggestion right there, I mean, just please, if you know how to speak a different language, you know, hone your own little thing about it. It's, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a really good idea. I want to get some, some Tintin in French, some old Tintin, and enjoy this pre- um this pre golden age comic because it ran um and, and also harry j produced this during world war ii in german occupied belgium now tintin did get a little political here and there but under the german occupation now they could keep the newspapers open if it was managed by the germans and so everyone kept their cool and you know Tin, uh, you know harry j became the uh, the editor for the the, the kids section of the newspaper and was able to keep Tintin alive and being published. I think it would be fascinating to see if there was anything subversive in there, you know, that was, um, but the Germans were, you know, basically watching Hergé. Hergé was, uh, kept it, you know, on the, on the level cause thing, bad things happen to good people who, you know, you know, to stand up to fascists or something. Oh, sorry, I don't want to like you know, ag aggravate the the algorithm. But um, yeah, let's see. Tintin's publication dates are between 1929 and 1976, and Tintin have had his own magazine between 1946 and 1976, and a set of graphic novels. Wow, I mean, just uh, this is why I love old comic books and about being able to go back and revisit these these classic things it's all brand new if you haven't gotten to it yet and i love that, that there's always something new to read even if it's old and uh while i had all these open windows i should be walking past right pika he brought up the cats and jammer kids now this is an american publication that ran um between 1914 um, and uh, ran up until no, it was it's actually no, no, no. I'm sorry. I, I mean, it was it had a a, a, a predate here too. Um, no, it its launch date was in 1897. The Cats and Jammer Kids. Um, its end date was January 1st of 2006. Wow. And um, this is one of the longest running comic strips ever. Wow, that's amazing. Now, the Cats and Jammer Kids um, was inspired by a children's story of the, of the 1860s. And um, Cats and Jammer translates literally as the wailing of cats, i.e. caterwauling. And, uh, but it is used to mean contrition after a failed endeavor or hangover in German. And then, uh, and so the cats and German kid, I'm reading this from the wiki. I'm trying to, uh, the characters and stories, there were three brothers in the first strip, but it was soon reduced to two. It was about Hans and Fritz, twins who rebelled against authority, particularly in the form of their mama, Dirk Captain, a sailor who acted as a surrogate father and Dirk Inspector, a long bearded school official. And, uh, the, I remember just seeing the, the cats and German kids is, are part of my cultural literacy. My, part of my comics cultural literacy, too. I remember the Cats and Jammer Kids being part of the daily and Sunday funnies in the newspapers. Back when newspapers meant something. Seriously, everyone read newspapers. Only few people read comic books. And it's, it's why comic books, too, like, you know, it's along the way that these things get destroyed. I mean, if they didn't sell in the newsstand, they would get their covers ripped off. And sent back to the publisher to be returned to pulp. And to be made into new comic books. New magazines. So the scarcity of these golden age, silver age comic books is, you know, literally, you know, what make everything so expensive. I would love to get some golden age books. But the, 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 pr the price of these golden age books are just, it's, it's, it's astounding. And, you know, it also would be the quote unquote and make a financial investment too. And something of, of, of art, you know, wouldn't that be like investing in art in a way, like having like, if you had thousands of dollars worth of 
golden age comic books. Jeez, that is in a way of like investing in like say like a, an original piece of art. There's only there are only there's only one of that. But like when it comes to a comic book, and the older they are, that there's a scarcity involved. And uh, but yeah, we, sorry. I mean, but cats and jammer kids. I mean, this ran for so long. Wow. I mean, that was just. I'm just. Yeah, I remember growing up with that. I talking about these pre golden age comics, Bad Band SNAs, and uh, Tintin. I like like I said, I want to get back. I want to get some Tintin into my life. But everyone knew who the Cats and Jammer Kids were too, as well. So these were like these were household names. On, all over the world. And uh, this would be technically the, the Platinum Age. And I'm going to like, you know, we're going to look it up in the uh, in the glossary here of the most current edition of the Overstreet Price Guide. Yeah, this is the, um, I'll read it to you here. The Platinum Age, comics published from 1883 to 1938. Right there. You see, like, you can read, right? I hope so. You know, pitch, well, comics have pictures. You know. <laughs> Pika, behave. Thank you so very much for tuning in today. <laughs> We've been talking about comic books, and we're going to talk about comic books every day for the rest of the year. So tune in tomorrow, 3 p.m., U.S. Eastern, and we'll find out who we're talking about when we turn the page tomorrow. Please like and subscribe. I would love to earn your subscription. We make daily content here. We talk about comic books every day. We make regular content here. We talk about soup, cooking, techniques, hacks. I'm a professional chef. I share things with you. I have got a playlist for that. Uh, we talk about gratitude. We talk about purpose. Uh, we also talk about Star Wars. We talk about... We might be starting to talk about Star Wars a little more as a historical artifact. I mean, I I know there's new Star Wars. I'm not interested, but I will never shut up about old Star Wars. Yeah, that's true. God bless. Namaste. Good luck. And we will see you again tomorrow in those funny pages. Cheers. Bye-bye.